talking about food allergy, uh, intolerances, and sensitivity, because when you have somebody with a chronic infection, perhaps 60 to 80% of the DNA in our cells is actually from the infectious agents. And so it's rather facile, shall I say, to think that one can eradicate the whole thing, perhaps just with courses of antibiotics. One has to look after the person who is harboring this. So one's not treating a disease, one's treating a person. In treating a person, you have to think about what they are meeting, whether they are harboring anything which is toxic to them, which you can get rid of perhaps by doing detox procedures, um, which will be impeding their body's ability to be able to fight off the infectious agent. Or indeed, whether they have these food sensitivities, intolerances, or um, allergies. And so one cannot ignore the fact that a person having contracted a Lyme infection may well have had these conditions anteceding the infection and uh, making the, the, the possibility of problems much worse because they have their toll on the body itself. We have homeostatic mechanisms, which are ones which are keeping things in balance in the body. And you can have homeostasis working at a good level when you're healthy, all the way up here. I'm just depicting it like that. But they can be a homeostatic mechanism working imperfectly, perhaps, and dragged down by the infection and working at this sort of level. In order to deal with the infection, which may be one component of a ring of problems, you have to deal with the other things that the person is encountering at that level and lift the whole thing up simultaneously to address the person's problems. So um, I mentioned here about food um, intolerance, allergy, and sensitivity. And I don't think it's easy to read all of this. I think it's a historical introduction uh, about um, food sensitivities. We've all known about this for many, many centuries. Historically, one man's meat is another man's poison, and that's from Lucretius. And uh, people have known about alactasia, which affects most of the Chinese people. They can't tolerate uh, the milk sugar and many from India and Africa. And since um, celiac disease was diagnosed initially at the beginning of the Second World War, um, wheat sensitivity has been acknowledged. And it's very common. There is celiac disease and also non-celiac wheat intolerance. Um, so just historically setting the scene, um, celiac disease was associated with schizophrenia when Dr. Dohan found that people were having more schizophrenia in some um, places. He, he looked at uh, the data in Finland. There was a drop of the incidence of schizophrenia in these countries when they couldn't get wheat, when they weren't able to import it in the war. And uh, he then did a, a, a study in which he took two groups of schizophrenics and fed them either wheat uh, um, containing diet or um, a cereal-free and milk-free diet and the, measured the rate of discharge of these people. And he found that they were discharged much more, much more quickly from hospital when they were on the special diet. And then further people looked at what are called transcephalic uh, direct currents in children with autism. And they found that if they um, uh, put them onto uh, a, a wheat-free diet, there was an alteration and an improvement in these children. 
So I just wanted to say that despite the fact that there's been historically information that people can have reactions to foods, this is um, often ignored. And um, nevertheless, what we've been doing is collecting at Breakspear a massive library. We've got some 3,000 books. Many of them are not available anywhere else in the world, um, unfortunately. And we've got um, them dating back from the 30s and so on, um, and going on for um, uh, literally hundreds of books. And the most extensive also um, collection of papers, again, many of them not available on ordinary PubMed, perhaps um, two-thirds of them not. And it show the reason why we've done this is because we've been interested in food sensitivities for many years. Dr. Richard McInnes is one of the pioneers in this country. He's the pioneer in this country of clinical ecology. He was looking at the way in which food and chemicals upset people. And um, he uh, produced a book called Not All in the Mind, in which he was proving that people um, could have symptoms, and it wasn't in their minds. Their symptoms were not uh, psychological, and they shouldn't definitely be put on the SSRIs, for another reason also, as P Professor Puri has been saying, it upsets their hearts. Um, and, but these people were all being dismissed. So the recognition of allergy or abnormal reactivity to foods has been debated, and its definition has been very controversial. Um, and this is really rather silly, because a lot of people have been uh, depending on just finding an IgE allergy, which is where people have a reaction to peanuts, and they might have a major reaction to foods. And that is not the sort of thing that we're talking about. Um, it's much more broad-based broad than that. So uh, the actual abnormal reactivity foods was diagnosed and uh, hypersensitivity described in, 19, in 1894. And anaphylaxis, where people collapse in 1901 and two. And that um, collapse is an effect of what's called the autonomic nervous system, which is our control mechanism for maintaining the blood supply and uh, blood pressure and other factors in the body. But then we had altered reactivity, which is described in 1906. And then finally, um, Henry Dale, who was a polymath, really, because he won the Nobel Prize for his work on the chemical transmission on nerve impulses, but he understood the pathogenesis of allergic disease and showed the effect of histamine being released, and that was um, in the 40s. So um, I, just to set the scene, there are many people with different problems with foods, and we have to consider milk and a lactasia. We have to consider, we know that favism uh, occurs as a Mediterranean disease where people react to broad beans and collapse because they have red cell disintegration with that, and celiac disease. So we look for the main things. And we can do blood tests to check out IgE and IgG-mediated allergens. IgE are immediate, immediate and IgG are ones which are sort of learned. And then we also look to see other ways in which foods need to be investigated. We look for small intestinal bacterial gr overgrowth, and uh, we do a lactose breath test and a lactulose breath test, because you have to discover whether it's really an allergic response or something that is going on in the lumen of the gut. And you can do a fructose breath test to measure fructose intolerance. So uh, you can then undertake treatment programs for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth with antibiotics that are not absorbed to clear the small intestinal bacteria. This is quite common now, and that's because Anyone who goes to um, a doctor with a, a gastrointestinal problem, they, they're immediately uh, thought to have something wrong with the stomach, and they're given 
the proton pump inhibitors which stop the production of gastric acid. Well, we need gastric acid. Gastric acid is there to sterilize food. Food isn't sterile when we consume it. It's not sterile. We have to sterilize it in the stomach. And the pH there is quite low, down to about 2 pH um, at ta in many people. Um, but if you stop that happening, then the food goes into the small intestine and you can have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So this can happen quite commonly uh, to people. Uh, and it, it's um, not just with drugs, but also spontaneously. Also, people have abnormal colonic flora and they have to have this looked at and managed. Often people with these problems will have increased gut permeability. And what happens then is particles of food will enter the system and um, will form antibody complexes. And I'll come to that in a moment. Um, Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. For many, for many time, for many many centuries, we've known that the aroma of the human breath has provided us clues to lots of problems. Uh, the breath will emit a fishy smell uh, with li liver disease and a, a, an acetone odor with pa patients with diabetes, uh, for example. So we know that the breath can be used diagnostically. And um, all the fermented dietary carbohydrates will produce acids and gases in the gut. Um, since only bacteria are capable of producing hydrogen and methane gases, the presence of these gases gives us an indication that there is um, uh, bacterial fermentation. So we can measure this by giving a patient a particular substance, which is a sugar, which isn't... Um, absorbed and um, then the hydrogen uh, breath can be measured and then we can do the same for lactose giving people lactase and then measuring the fermentation of that as it's broken into glucose or galactose and uh, when the level of the lac of the breath hydrogen is high initially um, then we can we, we can uh, diagnose lactose intolerance. So, um, to measure intestinal permeability, one can look for antibodies to a whole lot of the components of the gut lining, and these, in, and also to what are called lipopolysaccharides, which are there, um, which are from bacterial uh, c components. So looking at these um, is quite is very useful because you have to treat people who have got increased permeability, otherwise they will have a perpetuated food sensitivity. You can also, because I'm saying that it's important to check the three main food groups, which is milk, uh, the sugars, and uh, all the grains first, and then you can define things more after that. So you can do a wheat test, and uh, this is one that's available, and you can measure antibodies against a lot of different um, components of foods. And this is quite important. You can also do things against cross-reactive foods and foods uh, that are related. So you can do these tests for people who have frank celiac disease or non-celiac gluten, uh, gluten sensitivity too. And quite a lot of people who have neurological symptoms, as I've said at the beginning with Professor Dohan having an, uh, ascertained all that, and for the autistic children and so on, there are quite a lot of neurological autoantibodies which ha occur in people who have gluten sensitivity. So the foods that we prefer to have checked are ones which are cooked, uh, also raw, and perhaps modified foods as well, so that it's a broad spectrum. So with regard to 
sugars, we look at fructose, and fructose is a, a sugar that's broken down in the muscles or in the liver. It's the half of the cane sugar, the other half is, is um, glucose, and one measures short-chain fatty acids in the blood and part of the breakdown products to ascertain if a person has got fructose intolerance. Fructose 6-phosphate, lactate dehydrogenase, and these short-chain fatty acids. So uh, if I now come to food allergy, because you have to check the foods, the way they're affecting the gut, the gut flora, then you can check for food allergy. Now, the traditional way of finding out about food allergy is an elimination diet and introduction of foods after five days. And if the person has a reaction to the food when it's introduced, it's introduced as a single food, then um, the reaction can be a, a pulse change or a pulse change because the autonomic nervous system is affected. Um, Jonathan Brostoff, um, Professor Brostoff, wrote on food allergy and intolerance in his book in 1987. And it was a very important book because it brought to the attention of the medical profession that they shouldn't be ignoring people who present with food sensitivities. Because food sensitivities are common. Food allergies are common. And they are responsible for a large number of medical conditions like migraine, uh, like irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, sometimes they'll contribute to asthma, uh, eczema, all sorts of conditions and chronic fatigue. So IgE is actually the ones uh, like the peanut ones, and the primary way of avoiding that, uh, primary way of managing that is to avoid the food. But you can use a drug called sodium chromoglycate, which blocks uh, the effects. It's a, called a mast cell stabilizer. Um, so um, this is the chain of events. The food uh, allergen comes in contact with an antibody, forms a complex, and then this attaches to a cell, which will then release histamine, and this causes the activation of blood vessels with their dilatation and the release into the cells and fluids from the blood, the, uh, 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 the things which will destroy the complex to destroy that. So um, this is another way of depicting it. And it, uh, it shows that there's the antigen going into the gut and it can get through the gut uh, it can attach to antibodies um, and make IgE, IgA, IgG I, um, antibodies, um, complexes. And often it's more than one thing added together in a complex, one, one group. And what happens is that this will circulate and land on tissues in the body. And where it lands, it will give people symptoms rheumatoid arthritis, arthritic conditions, um, go to the brain, land on blood vessels and give people migraine, or come back again to the gut lining and uh, cause overactivity and symptoms of um, inflammatory bowel disease. So we, uh, if you use sodium chromoglycate, there are no mediators, no complexes and no symptoms. Um, and so um, this is what we did. We did with Jonathan Brostoff, and um, uh, we gave people an oral challenge, gave them sodium chromoglycate before, and measured lung function. Um, and uh, the depiction should be um, no drop in lung function with sodium chromoglycate, um, and a drop in lung function without. And so this is exactly what we did. Here is uh, a particular uh, depiction of the peak flow in a, somebody with asthma after an egg challenge. Um, and itch and wheeze was caused by the, by the egg challenge. And then um, 
another one with preservatives, because it doesn't have to be food. It can be things that are put in with the food which does this. And this was somebody with um, a preservative uh, sensitivity. And you can see the drop in peak flow. And so we then me measured ultracentrifugation of the atopic serum, and we would find various um, gradients and we could find different c complexes in this, in these um, these groups, monomer and complexed groups. So these are all types of uh, complexes, and so the reactions can be, as I've been depicted, things coming either through the cell themselves or between the cells in the in the gut lumen. IgA antibodies are one of the major groups of antibodies in the body. And these um, are the protective antibodies in the gut lumen. They have the pr function of protecting it from uh, attack by b bacteria. And they stop bacterial adhesion. But they also attach to food particles. And they actually are one of the ways that we would absorb food into the body. Because when they're in the body, they don't cause an immune reaction. So they are a transport mechanism. So we can get lumps of food into the body attached to IgA, and it's protective. But there is a, a condition in which people have IgA deficiency, um, and it affects 1 in 700 people and they will all be very subject to food sensitivities. But also secretory IgA is in the gut lumen. And in people who have um, inflammatory bowel disease, for example, um, you can look and see if there are inflammatory markers in the gut lumen, from the gut lumen, in the stool, and you can measure secretory IgA. And uh, you can find that if the secretory IgA is markedly elevated, very likely the body is reacting massively to foods or chemical or, or bacteria. And if you have um, very low levels of secretory IgA, it's because IgG antibodies have been formed. And what happens is that um, IgG antibodies uh, produce these complexes, and they go back to the gut lining where IgA is made and inhibit its formation. So you have IgG antibodies inhibiting IgA, and therefore you've got a sort of perpetuation of food sensitivities. So you have to stop that. And the way of doing that, because it's usually more than one food that's involved if you've got a leaky gut, is uh, food avoidance. But also, um, one can, excuse me, I'm just skipping along a little bit. Uh, also, you can um, use treatment programs such as sodium chromoglycate or we use one which is called low-dose immunotherapy. Now this, people tend to think, is in the hands of a few people, a few practitioners. But in fact, in Richard Mackinnis's book, uh, uh, Food Allergy and Intolerance, um, he's described exactly how it can be done. It can be done in the laboratory, and it can be done in the, in the clinic, and in fact, I did it in an airplane once when somebody collapsed in front of me. I found out what they'd just eaten. I said, what's happened to this person? Because they, they roused me from my torpor. And um, so I had a whole row of spoons. I put water in 10 spoons. And I put a little drop of the coffee containing their coffee mate or whatever it was into each into the first one, and then a drop from that into the next, and one from that into the next. And when I put this on the person's hand, they sat up. I said, we don't need your adrenaline, because they were all rushing around with their little bags to try and give this person adrenaline. And she was perfectly all right. 
as soon as um, she was treated appropriately. It's an autonomic response, and it responds to autonomic triggering in the skin as well. So um, you can do IgE and other food panels, uh, as I've said, so, um, and yeast and intestinal immunity panels. But I want to come on to, um, to these are all different panels of things that can be measured. We have to look, too, at infections. One of them is streptococci, and we practically all harbor streptococci, but streptococci make a lysin, which is a lysate, and when you have this being formed, some people develop an antibody to the streptococcal lysate, and that you can measure with an anti-streptolysin teeter, and such a person needs long-term antibiotics if they've got this, because they have chronic infections, which can give them carditis, as, as um, Basant has been explaining. But in, a, in this particular chronic infection, it is a bacterial lysate that's doing it. It can cause rheumatic fever. It can give people kidney disease. Um, so we need to do that. Now, I want to just come on to a sensitivity. So I've talked about intolerances and how they're often due to enzyme deficits about uh, food allergies. And now I want to talk about a lymphocyte sensitivity test because people can have sensitivities which are not necessarily antibody-based reactions. And this is where the food will, um, or chemicals, can give people a problem. And this is done by, a test is done by Dr. John McLaren Howard. And what he has done is to look at a group of chemicals, um, such as nickel, which is present in an awful lot of foods, salicylate, which represents hundreds of um, foods that are um, salicylate containing. There are many, many plants with that. Um, metabisulfite, it's present as a preservative in foods, but also a number of chemicals. And what he does is he looks at the cells under a microscope and um, there is a particular way of looking at this. It's called confocal microscopy. And around this cell, you'll see it's sort of slate blue color. And that is calcium, which is colored that color, um, because it's got a probe which shows blue. And this is a depiction of a cell from someone who was sensitive to metabisulfite. So there's the innocuous looking cell. And after some, um, uh, sulfite was added to the slide, look, there goes the calcium into the cell. And that cell, uh, if it were in, uh, in life, in the body, would be unable to perform its functions because the calcium stuck the cells, to the proteins inside there together and uh, all the enzymes and structural proteins are not um, adequately able to function because the calcium can't get out. It's stuck. So when you have an, a problem with sensitivities, the cells become defunct. Here's another picture of somebody sensitive to formaldehyde because this doesn't happen only to foods but also to chemicals. And there is on exposure to formaldehyde. So what do you what does one do for these people? You can avoid some things, yes, but you have to protect the cell wall. And there are a number of things which are mast cell stabilizers. One of them is sodium chromoglycate, um, uh, uh, which I've mentioned so far. It's a mast cell stabilizer. Another is um, an antihistamine type preparation called Ketotifen, and the third is Neuroprotec, uh, uh, which is uh, a herbal medical medicine. Uh, and it, it, they can all help to stabilize cell walls. But we found that when we use these low-dose immunotherapy neutralizing vaccines, which we have ascertained from this series of dilutions called provocation neutralization, we can protect 
the person from their sensitivities. So what we do is say, first of all, stop having artificial ingredients which can perpet sensitivity, perpetuate sensitivities, and then encourage this oral tolerance by specifically encouraging immunological unresponsiveness, which is induced by the prior oral administration of antigen, and it's antigen-specific. Now, the reason I say this is because underneath the tongue, there are no mast cells. These are the ones which release histamine, I've been explaining earlier. There aren't any there. And so you can use that site for an encouragement of tolerance. And of course, we have to have this because food has to be accepted. Um, and it's, it starts um, in even in neonates who are not tolerant. And you have to actually start to think about how oral tolerance is encouraged. So I'll just quickly go through um, the low-dose immunotherapy that we use. This is not the same as being um, a, a sort of blockbuster one that's being used at the moment, which is being given from time to time. It's actually one where you've titrated the dose because we want to show you that this is uh, a, a very real way of supporting individuals. Um, and it's got a, a long history starting in, in 1911 when they were talking about hay fever desensitization. And then in the 1960s, Dr. Miller uh, found that he could use this as a safe and effective treatment for sensitivities, both foods, chemicals, and inhalants. And he did the tests with intradermal testing or sublingual testing. Um, and it, it is actually uh, it's one of the um, principal ways of treatment endorsed by the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. And they, there are a lot of references. I've just listed them here. It's not possible to read them all. But um, it can be used um, for patients with a broader spectrum of sensitivities. And you have a solution of the subject of the substance and see how a person reacts to it and use a weaker dilution. And you then take the treatment regularly at home. It's been used on approximately 20 million people worldwide without any serious adverse effects. So um, it's there's a review article on allergen-specific immunotherapy uh, from LASH in 2006, and they say it's the robust and clinically effective form of treatment that induces active immunity to the allergen, and it's disease-modifying rather than palliative. So it's not like take this drug for asthma. It's take this and get rid of your asthma, perhaps giving, given some time. And um, it prevents the onset of new sensitization, improves the quality of life of the treated individuals, and reduces symptoms. And the WHO has endorsed the, this type of immunotherapy. It says drugs provide symptomatic treatment, whereas allergen avoidance and immunotherapy are the only therapeutic modalities to modify the natural course of disease. So we've shown that there are two um, principal um, pathways to consider in allergy. One is the autonomic nervous system, which controls things through the, the base of the brain, um, where information goes to everywhere in the body. The autonomic nervous system is the neural pathway for allergy, and this has been proven by um, Dr. Mayan and Shepherd, the University of Ma Manchester. What we found is that where we can measure the auto where we can measure the autonomic nervous system's responses, um, we have been able to as ascertain that things can improve with low dose immunotherapy. And here we are. This is a person whose record of um, uh, the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, is 
going along here, then for this period of time, they blow against a closed glottis. And when they do that, the intrathoracic pressure is raised, the pressure inside the thoracic cavity. When it's raised, it pushes the blood out. And so it's a sort of emergency situation for the heart. It says, where's my next blood for the next pump that uh, Professor Puri has been showing? It's got to have the input of blood for it to be able to pump. So it says, emergency, quick, quick, send me some blood. And it causes the uh, ordinarily, uh, it should make all the the major organs in the abdomen, the spleen, the liver, the kidneys, squeeze and push blood into the thorax against that held breath. And it should reach a target, it should come back to a good blood pressure. In this particular person, she was constantly fainting and falling away and so on, because she had impaired autonomic function in the splanchnic blood vessels in the, uh, in the splanchnic organs, these organs in the abdomen. And so we gave her, her vaccines for 25 common foods and uh, then did the test again. And you can see that she's perfectly capable of doing this. This is somebody who was collapsing about all over the place because she didn't have the blood pressure to do anything. And um, so that depicts what happens and here, is another one who was doing an exercise, a very simple exercise, holding a thing like a tuning fork and grasping it. And this person uh, was using her muscles, therefore there was less blood in the heart. And so what they would, she was doing was to show that, what we were doing was to show that she wasn't able to vasoconstrict, she had to constrict the blood vessels in the muscles in order to be able to get more blood to the heart to get a proper uh, blood pressure. This is called, this, this was the diastolic blood pressure and this was the heart rate. So after a week's treatment with 25 different low-dose immunotherapy, you can see that she was quite capable of reaching the targets. So we know that the autonomic nervous system is affected by sensitivities and it can be controlled. And we then did uh, one of the lymphocyte sensitivity tests that I've been describing that was done by John McLaren Howard um, before and after low-dose immunotherapy. And the intracellular calcium levels were being measured by this fluorescent probe. And what we found was that when we had patients who had this test done before they had their vaccines and then after, there was a dramatic percentage decrease in that intracellular calcium. And um, there are these percentages and these p-values and um, Professor Puri has been kind enough to, to work all this out for us. And it, the numbers of patients are depicted here, 44-odd patients. So it's quite substantive to show that if you look at these p-values, um, showing that it's very statistically significant, um, I think it's, it's self-evident that you can alter heightened sensitivities. And we use this immunotherapy sublingually or, or by injection, but now more uh, uh, allergists throughout the UK are using a transcutaneous route, They're rubbing things on the skin for um, heightened sensitivities. And they're by an epicutaneous route just on the skin. So I just think that that's really a very important um, message. One can actually do things from the skin, where every fourth cell is an autonomic nervous system receptor cell. 
and it goes to the brain. So we know that it's possible to do that. The skin can absorb large amount of chemicals and other things. If you rub things on the skin, they're absorbed. And so we've been finding, for example, that a large number of people have chemicals from hair products and all kinds of things that they've absorbed and they're impeding their function. So I just wanted to emphasize that in people who have chronic infections, uh, they may well have food sensitivities. In fact, it's extremely common because, uh, as I've said, migraine affects a third of the population, IBS affects a third of the population. They may not be the same thirds. Um, there are, uh, people can have these things. If they've got a chronic infection too, they will not be able to recover health unless you address all sorts of things to do with their body's uh, homeostatic mechanisms. And this is one that must be addressed because if it's not, you're neglecting to look at the person and just treating the disease. Dr. Alison Bunin did a, a detailed study of, PhD, uh, of 30 patients for her PhD thesis some years ago. And she looked at what had happened to all these people. They'd visited their family doctors 1,936 times, these 30 patients. They were being ignored uh, because it hadn't been recognized as to what they'd got. They'd been to 822 hospital appointments. Just think of the waste of money. And this was done in a couple of, about 15 years ago or, or, or more, more, actually. And they'd spent a whole lot of days in hospital, taken thousands of days off work, consumed uh, uh, huge quantities of drugs, probably all affecting their... Um, well, all affecting their metabolic capabilities, but many of them would have been the SSRIs, which would have been affecting their hearts, and then had to go to see another specialist to deal with that. Um, so uh, each person had cost the, 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 the health service at that time a huge amount of money. Um, you can see that it's uh, a waste and it's a waste of an individual's life. In her opinion, she said, food allergy sufferers have two wars to fight. They have to face symptoms, including arthritis, headaches, asthma, skin, digestive disorders, and they have to battle against the failure of recognition of their basic condition. So I think that in this setting, uh, we have, fortunately, a, a a large group of practitioners who are interested in uh, the individual as a whole. And food intolerance, allergy and sensitivity cannot be ignored as a component of looking after a person with, with a chronic infectious disease. Thank you.